Let's start with a question. And the question is, is it the church's mission to improve the world? I won't ask you to answer out loud, but internally, I'm sure you're ready spontaneously to give an answer to that question, which is, I admit, a trap question. Because on the one hand, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and have been born again by God's Spirit and have trusted in Him to be your only sufficient saving substitute on the cross once for all, died, buried, risen again, descended into heaven. If you're putting your trust in him and not in yourself or in your religious practice or in donations you make to charitable or organizations or such like, then you certainly hope that your Christian testimony will make a difference in the world. Yeah. But on the other hand, if we look back at the last 2,000 years, and if we are acquainted with the history of the church, the professing church, both the real church of those who have trusted the gospel and those whom we might uh, describe as Christendom, the attempt to bring Christianity and kingdoms of this world together into kind of a religious state, then we would have to conclude that, well, maybe what we see going on around us is not all that new. Is it the church's mission to make the world a better place? There are many people today who would profess to know Christ who believe that the mission of the church is to kind of take over the institutions of the world and gradually to improve the world so that finally at the end when the church uh, really has purified society around the world, Christ can come back and, and the kingdom will have been introduced by the church, allowing Jesus to return uh, physically, corporately. But I don't believe that's true. And we'd like to look uh, this evening at a passage in Scripture which I think supports the notion Luke 21 is the chapter, if you have your Bible. It will certainly give us a bird's eye view of what the Lord Jesus Christ expected between the moment of his ascension into heaven and the time of his return. You will find many people today who really would like to get rid of the church entirely. And they say that Christian people are of no use to the world. In fact, the world would be a better place without the church than it has been with it. Because, after all, Christians just make everybody feel guilty, and they fill the world with bigotry and hypocrisy, and they keep people from self-actualization, whatever that really, really, however you would like to define that term. And the secular agenda that we live in is certainly true here in Spain, and certainly was true in Northern Europe, where Kathy and I spent most of our life. Um, secular critics of religion will insist that organized religion stifles curiosity. It encourages people to rely on useless things like prayer, rather than reason and human initiative to solve difficult problems. And they say it pours cold water on scientific research. These critics, of course, scorn the, the fact that biblical Christianity, like all religions, and I might add like secularism itself, in the end makes an appeal to authority when it has to explain the meaning and purpose of puzzling things. Everybody in the end has a starting point, a set of assumptions that he starts with, and everybody ultimately makes an appeal to some kind of authority, whether it's the scripture, or my human reason, or trust your heart. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all appeals to a final authority. 
Let's just imagine that the Christian faith were consistently practiced. The, 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 the real biblical gospel by every professing believer in Jesus Christ. Should churches around the world expect to be able to clean up the mess that's all around us? My impression is that the mess is getting worse and thicker as time goes by. What are we here to do? What is the mission of the church? I would like us to look at Luke chapter 21, and this is the first of a new series of um, scripture studies that Sam has asked me to start on these first, Saturdays, first Sundays of, uh, of each month on some passages that deal with uh, things to come. Um, in theological terms, we often speak of eschatology, the study of last things or future things. And I'd like to begin with just this passage because Luke 21, along with the parallel passages, Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, uh, four chapters in the Synoptic Gospels, these contain what is probably the longest answer by Jesus to any single question in all of the Gospels. Four chapters dedicated to a question that we're going to read about in just a few moments. And I would like us to see what Jesus said about two things. Number one, are things going to get better and better through the influence of the gospel in the world? And number two, what does the Lord Jesus Christ want the local church to really aim for in the fulfillment of her mission? The first question deals with the results of our fulfilling our mission, and the second deals with what the mission is itself. And I believe we're going to find answers to these questions in Luke 21, and then at the end we'll look briefly at a couple statements in Luke 24. In both of these passages, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to his disciples in very clear terms. And as we read through them, you might say, well, I don't know if it's all that clear. Well, just try to stay with me, and we'll try to explain as we go along. And the method we're going to use in listening to what Jesus says is what we would call the plain meaning of the text, the way we speak to each other. Obviously, there are going to be figures of speech from time to time. We all use figures of speech as a kind of shorthand or a way to add a little color uh, to uh, our conversation. But Jesus is giving a straightforward answer to a straightforward question. And so we're going to try to apply this principle in a consistent way. And uh, let's just see how we do. If we get through all of chapter 21, I think we'll be doing very well, especially if we finish before midnight? No, before 6.30. Let's see how, can, how we can progress. Luke 21, 1 to 37 predicts, as Jesus answers a question by his disciples, that as history unfolds, things are going to get worse, not better, if you will look at things on the surface. Let me just brush, before we get to the, the opening section in Luke 21, a little background to uh, this chapter. If you have your Bible, go back to Luke chapter 9, and as I read a, a number of verses here, I want you to look for a phrase or a motif that is repeated throughout these verses. Luke 9, verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now go to Luke 30, 13, verse 22. Luke 13, 22. And he, that is Jesus, went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. 
Chapter 17, verse 11. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Go across the page to chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Chapter 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Verse 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to <coughs> Jerusalem. Verse 41. And when he was come near it, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chiefs of the people sought to destroy him, and could not find what they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. As you go through chapter 20, and compare it to the parallel passages in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21 particularly, and Mark 12, you will discover that each of them emphasizes a number of events in the final week of Jesus' ministry as he is in the temple in Jerusalem. <coughs> and certainly you notice, as we went through these passages, that right from the, before the middle of Luke, he begins to sound this little drumbeat. It's kind of like Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, where in the about six minutes into the first uh, movement, here you hear this uh, the snare drum that begins this little tapping, and it builds this crescendo. You know this piece, right? Uh, no answer. Uh, check it out. Listen to the Shostakovich Seventh, uh, seventh Symphony, the Leningrad Symphony. Uh, go about six minutes in, and you'll hear what I'm talking about. It's, it's a little motif that builds and builds and builds, and that's what you've got here in Luke 9 and following. We're going up to Jerusalem, and it is not a happy time that awaits Jesus when he gets to Jerusalem, because that is going to be where he is crucified. And so uh, Luke will speak in chapter 20 about uh, the authority of Christ, which is challenged by the Jewish leaders in chapter 20, verses 1 to 8. In verses 9 to 18, you'll see how Jesus gives the parable of the landowner who rents out his land to vine growers, and uh, they decide that they would like to get the land for themselves, and so they slaughter all of the servants that the landowner sends uh, them. And finally, he sends them his son, thinking that certainly they will honor the son, but uh, they kill the son and uh, try to take what the landowner owns for themselves. In verses 19 to 26, you find the leaders of uh, the Jewish people asking Jesus a trap question about taxation. Should we pay the tax to uh, Caesar? And Jesus replies to that question, when you pay to Caesar what Caesar is due, and you pay to God what is due him. There's a trap question from the Sadducees about the resurrection. And the question uh, then that follows is a question that Jesus asks himself to his enemies. He, he says, uh, who is the son of David? And uh, David says that um, um, his son is David's Lord. How is that possible? 
And then at the very end, when you come to Luke chapter 21, you find that Jesus in the temple sees an old lady uh, putting in a gift into the temple treasury, verses 1 uh, and following, 1 to 4. And she uh, places the last thing she has into the temple treasury. And Jesus says that she gave more than all of the wealthy people who gave a little bit, uh, but made a show of their generosity. And then when we come to Luke 21, verse 5, to the end of the chapter, we come to a prophecy that Jesus gives about the future of the city of Jerusalem, where he is ministering, and particularly the future of the temple, where he is teaching. Very significant. Let's read beginning in verse 5. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. If you've ever visited the Temple Mount in Jerusalem or seen pictures of it, you know that the Temple Mount today is the largest single stone platform of this nature anywhere in the world. It's vast. And it is built upon an area on uh, the mountain there of Jerusalem that still holds many mysteries. It's filled with tunnels that uh, uh, the Jewish people are not allowed to uh, go in and uh, try to explore because of the waqf the uh, managed by the Jordanian uh, authority which has oversight of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dole Rock in a kind of uh, perpetual non-profit association uh, arrangement uh, does not let the Jews uh, go in there and, and look at these areas so we're not quite sure where those honeycomb tunnels lead but the platform is the only thing that's left today of what in Jesus' day was the Herodian temple, the second temple that had been expanded by King Herod. And if you go underneath uh, the western part of those walls, um, you have to go down several levels to see them. You see these ashlar stones that are, uh, that are almost as long as this meeting room all carved out in a distant quarry. Tremendous, and they're impressive even to us today. And there must have been votive offerings, precious stones or other things that were in the temple that reminded people of the wealthy gifts of other people. And so the disciples of Jesus, who were um, walking out of the temple, Matthew 24 tells us, uh, were admiring this wonder of the world, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, in fact, the Jewish temple. Uh, wow, this is really a fantastic place. And we find that Stephen, in Acts 7, would look back and reproach the Jews for placing their confidence in their wonderful building. It must have been tremendously impressive. And then Jesus comes and lays this statement on them. In verse 6, everything's going to come down. When you see a majestic building, and you hear someone say, it's going to come down, you probably kind of retreat in a bit of shock. What would you have said had you been in New York City in 2001, uh, maybe a day before the World Trade Center fell? We had some friends in Luxembourg who visited the World Trade Center the day before it was bombed. Little did they imagine that the next day it would be a pile of rubble. And had anyone told them, they would probably have said, oh, come on, that's not possible. And that was the response of the disciples. Verse 7 shows us their amazement and their logical question. They asked him, saying, Master, when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? <clears throat> uh, let's hope that there's a warning. In verses 8 and 9, we see Jesus talk about some things that are going to take place first. Now, let me just warn you about something. 
because the order of the paragraphs in Luke 21 seems to hop around in terms of time. And maybe I can illustrate how this goes when we speak to each other. Let's imagine that you were to ask uh, Sam, uh, I hear we're going as a church to El Torcal. So could you explain to me what's on tap for the day? And maybe he will tell you, well, it's going to be on such and such a day, and uh, we'll be meeting here at um, 8.30, if you need a ride. And the purpose of the visit is to uh, look at the, the rock formations and uh, hear something about how we would explain those rock formations in the light of Genesis 6 through 9 and the global flood. And then he might shift gears and come backwards to a question. So, do you need a ride? Um, maybe you need a map. What we're going to do is go from here and um, we'll be uh, getting onto the A7 and you take the A7 through the pass and up in the direction of Antequera and then you look for, uh, what is the name of the little town, um, uh, the, the little white village there, um, I can't remember the name. And then you wind around and you'll get to, the, to El Torcal Bajo, but you need to go toward El Torcal Alto. And oh, by the way, uh, before you go, you should uh, pack a lunch, you'll need some water. You see how his description kind of hops around and, and we can take that on board because we understand the context. He doesn't have to map out every detail in the exact sequence of uh, what the events are going to be because logically he would say, do you want to go? Okay, the first thing you need to do is you need to pack your lunch and, and, and then the night before and then you need to get out of bed in the morning and you need to brush your teeth and you meet, meet, meet here at 8.30 and we'll be distributing maps. You could, you could tell the sequence of events in strict order or you can hop back and forth and move from one part of the sequence to the other, backtracking in some places, and you will be understood. That's a little bit what you have in Luke 21, because Jesus is going to talk about some things that happen in the short term, and then he's going to talk about some things that are going to happen much later, and then he's going to backtrack and fill in some of the gaps, and then he's going to keep moving ahead. You need to realize that Luke 21 and also to a certain extent, Matthew 24 and Mark 13 do the same thing. And that's not because Jesus is confused or because the evangelists who wrote the Gospels from either notes that they took or from memory of what he said were confused. It's uh, the way we communicate in, in, the, in real life. So having uh, mentioned that, look at verses 8 and 9. This is the beginning of Jesus' reply. He said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. That's the second thing that they would say. So, I am the Messiah, and the time, the, the, mom, the momentous time of the, the wrapping up of history is getting close. Go ye not therefore after them, Jesus says. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. Notice the word first. The end of verse 9 says, but the end is not by and by. <laughs> it's a, a, a rather unusual way of the authorized version rendering this. It, it's not here immediately. <coughs> The end is not here yet, so here are a few things that must take place first before the end. And he mentions just a few things. Number one, the deception of false messiahs. There are going to be many who will come in Jesus' name, and they will claim to be the savior of the world, and they will claim that uh, the wrapping up of world history is just around the corner. You better listen to them. And then secondly, Jesus says that there will also be disasters on a significant scale. Wars and commotions. The idea is um, wars and 
riots, disturbances, tumults, conflicts. But he says the end does not come right away. The end is still out there. So first of all, is squeezed against not yet in his answer. So when you see these things happen, he says to his disciples, do not assume that we are right up against the end. The end is not yet. Now when you go to verses 10 and 11, you will see that Jesus moves to thinking about things that are going to happen much further in the future. And he is launched into verses 10 and 11 by his reference to the end in the end of verse 9. The end is not immediate. <coughs> Notice the, the, the shift in the paragraph. Then he said to them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful signs, and great signs shall there be from heaven. These are mentioned also in the parallel passages in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. And on your own time, I encourage you to go back and look at those parallel passages which shed uh, some, uh, some additional light on this because all gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are selective because they have a specific purpose in writing their book. Just the way if I were to ask you to write a a, a book about, let's say, the history of the Iglesia Bautista Arroyo de la Miel. You would be selected. You would remember certain things, and other people would remember other things. And in some cases, there would be some overlap because both of you were uh, present at, a, at the same event, or you knew the same people. But each one of us would give a slightly different angle. And so Luke has a particular audience in mind, a largely Gentile audience, and he is not going to answer all of the the, the questions that the disciples asked, and you will find that there are more questions that they asked on this occasion, and there is more information given, for example, in Matthew 24. What is significant in both Mark 13 and Matthew 24 is that these items mentioned in verses 10 and 11 are called the beginning of birth pangs. And I believe that these are best understood as signs that will occur during the last seven years before Jesus returns to set up his kingdom. The reason I believe that is that you can go back into the Old Testament, and I'd be very tempted to take the rest of our time this evening to go through these in a little bit of depth, but I'll just give you the references in case you're taking notes. Check Isaiah 13, 6 to 10, Jeremiah 30, verses 1 to 9, and Micah 4, verse 9. And you will see that these prophets, these are examples, refer to a, a parallel between the difficulties of the people of Israel before the Messiah returns and the feeling of a woman who is ready to give birth to a baby. Now, I can't claim any uh, direct experience uh, with this. I have observed this, where we have three children, and as you would imagine, Kathy went through birth pangs for every one of the three. And according to what she said and what I observed, it was not a pleasant experience. It started with, uh, you know, I guess. The ladies, you'll have to forgive me for imprecision on this if what I'm saying doesn't match reality. But as uh, the hours go by, depending upon how long the birth pangs are going to last, they become more and more intense and they get closer and closer together. And uh, you will want to be in the hospital uh, to have some help before the time comes to actually give birth to the baby. That is the analogy that's used here. That the birth of the baby is like the rebirth of the nation of Israel, a regenerated Jewish people who are ready for the Messiah. 
And before that nation is born, there are contractions that are violent, that are increasing in intensity, and they are painful. Very interesting to note this week, I, I looked at a book on Google, which you can check out yourself, by Rafael Patai, P-A-T-E-I, who wrote a book that has been scanned in, to some extent called The Messianic Texts. And on pages 95 to 97, you can read a number of paragraphs there which will show you that uh, many Jewish people uh, in the time right before the first century and in the time of the development of the Babylonian Talmud, uh, as the rabbinic tradition developed in the first few centuries after Christ, believed that there would be seven years of tremendous difficulty before the coming of the Messiah to set up the kingdom of David. It would be filled with trouble, and the trouble would be worldwide. And after these dire circumstances, the Messiah would come, the nation would be born into the Messianic age. Very interesting to see how these notions that were true in Judaism really reflect the scriptures in Daniel. Uh, it comes right out of Daniel chapter 9. This, these were not just the legends or myths, although uh, Raphael Patai seems to present this as if it were just a legend or a myth. I know that there are some who look at these two verses, verses 10 and 9, uh, excuse me, 10 and 11, uh, and the parallel passages in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, and say, well, you know, um, these things began to be launched right after the uh, time of Jesus. And we have always had nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There have always been great earthquakes in various places. There always have been famines and pestilences. And I suppose there have been some great signs from heaven, you know, meteors falling and devastating huge forests in northern Siberia and such things. Yes, that's true. But I would conclude where I am in my understanding of how these passages fit together at this point. That because they are called the birth pangs, the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of the birth pangs, that this is tied in to the tribulation period so identified by Jesus and the book of Revelation that it will be seven years before the coming of the Messiah to reign on the earth. And so this is part of daily experience, of course, for many people, uh, but at a lower level. Now, those who have a different view, I don't think that one could say that uh, interpretation is heretical if one says, well, these things have already been launched and they're just going to grow in intensity until Christ comes back. But in light of 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, where Paul says that uh, people will be eating and drinking and going through the normal stages of everyday life, and then the pang will hit them. The day of the Lord will come. And he uses the same metaphor, that the pang, the birth pang, comes upon them, and the day of the Lord is launched. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. He's talking about things that are going to take place right before the end. Nations will be pitted against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. Um, you know, that's more than a political squabble between Ben al and Torremolinos. That is world conflict, world war. Earthquakes of great magnitude, Seismoi Megalowe. Great earthquakes. Not a little tremor. We've had tremors in Luxembourg. There were a couple of, um, of uh, chimney pots that fell over. And I remember when we had that earthquake way back at the beginning when we didn't even have a very good bed and the, the mattress kind of went like this. <laughs> and after 10, 15 seconds, it was all over. That's, that's not an earthquake. We need to have um, some input from our Japanese friends to really tell us what an earthquake is like. <laughs> and that's what this will be like. Great earthquakes. Great seismic events. Plagues. Lithoi, many plagues in history, of course. And um, the time is going to come when they're going to be far more severe. When you read in Revelation chapter 6 and look about the first seals that are opened, you find that 
huge swaths of the world's population will die as a result of these things. Famines. Already on record, there are at least 2,000 great famines in world history. There are going to be more later. The third seal judgment in Revelation 6 talks about one of them. There will be terrors and great signs in the heavens. Maybe meteors. The book of Revelation talks about a mountain that will come out of the heavens and will smash into the earth. And when you look at the Old Testament prophets as well as the book of Revelation, you find that God says he's going to turn the lights up, that the sun will be black, that the moon will not give off its light, that the stars of the heavens will be extinguished. You say, well, obviously that, that can't happen, can it? The Bible says it, it will. Not only can it happen, but the God who made them can turn them off. You say, well, how, how can he do that? Well, I guess he can do it any way he wants. I don't know the answer to that. The Bible doesn't tell us how he's going to do it. But it is a kind of staging event because right before the Messiah returns, in the glory of his Father, it is going to be dark everywhere. Try to imagine that. No sun, no moon, no starlight. Wow. And, then, and then the Lord Jesus comes back and the, the scriptures say, every eye will see him. If the world is still turning on its axis within 24 hours, Everybody on planet Earth will be able to see Christ returning in his glory with his angels. So there are things that must take place first, but it's not yet the end. And there are other things that will take place right before the end. And then pick up the reading in verses 12 to 19. There are things that will take place before all these things. Look at, again at the time the time marker here. Jesus says, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, <clears throat> being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. That, that is to say, what looks like a menacing event will actually become an opportunity for you to give testimony of your faith in me. Verse 14. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. John, I was so glad that you chose Psalm 27 to read tonight, and that we sang the musical version of that song, which talks just about this problem. When my mother and my father forsake me, you will pick me. And that will be the experience, Jesus says, before all these things come into the flow of history, you're going to face some of this in the very near future. And the book of Acts tells us some of those things. And the rest of church history tells us of how in the time of the apostles and the post-apostolic time, all the way through the persecutions of the Roman emperors, where in various places in the Roman Empire, the Romans, when they realized that Christianity was no longer a sect of Judaism, which was a protected religion under Rome, but it was something separate, and that Christians said, we worship Jesus alone, and we will not make a sacrifice to the, uh, the deity of Caesar. Ah, this is immense. We're going to have to get rid of the Christians. And so there were places and times during those first 300 years or so where Christians had to face this kind of thing. And we also see the strength of Jewish persecution of the early church in the book of Acts. And this continued for some time. Both the secular state of Rome and the Jews who uh, believed that Christianity was a blasphemous religion, they both opposed the testimony of those early disciples. So you've got arrest, 
persecution, imprisonment, and all of this will be an opportunity for you to testify, even though it will be painful. You will be betrayed, some of you will face death, there will be general hatred, and yet in all of this there will be deliverance. And he says, not a hair of your head will perish. Um, either that means that in some cases they will be physically rescued, or Jesus is using a metaphor to get across uh, the idea, don't be afraid of this because you are secure in my hand. Now I think that these verses so far help to answer our first question. Did the disciples expect that things were going to get better and better, and that it was the mission of the church to improve the world? So far, it looks like there's only going to be hostility to the gospel message. Mm -hmm. Both before all these things, and in the end. Now finally, when we pick up the reading in verse 20, we see Jesus answering the specific question that the disciples asked at the beginning. And you will find this if you talk to any teacher about any topic that there is in the world. You ask him a direct question, and usually he will kind of lay the groundwork for his answer, and he'll be going off on this rabbit trail and on this rabbit trail, and maybe a third one, and then he'll finally get to the point of your question. And that's what Jesus does here. Not because he has forgotten the question, or he wants to be evasive, but he's laying a context for the answer. Look at verse 20. Uh, we didn't read verse 19. In your patience, possess your souls. Uh, in other words, persevere in, in, in the face of this hostility. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Judea is the mountainous region in the lower central part of Israel. Today it would be called by many the southern portion of the West Bank. Let them flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it, that is, of Jerusalem, depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. So, if you live in the countryside, go, do not go into the city of Jerusalem. And if you're in the city of Jerusalem, get out of town and go into the mountains to uh, save your life. Why? Verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now here's the pith of Jesus' answer to this particular question uh, mentioned by Luke in Luke 21. When will these things be that the temple is destroyed and what are the signs that it's going to happen? The sign is indicated in verse 21. Uh, I'm sorry, verse, one, uh, verse 20. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation of Jerusalem is very close. And you can find out in looking at the history of the period from 66 after Christ until 70 AD that there were two menacing events. One, a leader in Rome came to Jerusalem and surrounded it with his armies. And then for various reasons, he had to retreat and take care of some other problems. There was some time, if you were a Jew living in Jerusalem, to get out of town because the Romans had left. But within a, within a fairly short period, Titus and his father came back as a representative of Rome and surrounded the city of Jerusalem again, laid siege to it, and brought the temple down and killed about 1.1 million Jews. Jesus says, if you 
see the menace begin. Get out of town while you still can. As a matter of fact, history seems to indicate, at least the things that I've been able to read, that many Christian Jews who lived in Jerusalem did use that window of time to get out of Jerusalem, and they founded Jewish Christian communities on the other side of the Jordan River. And they were not touched by the Roman hordes. And there was not the kind of great loss of life that many Jews experienced when uh, if they stayed in the city of Jerusalem. And so these things actually happen just as Jesus predicted. He says these are going to be days of vengeance. Why vengeance? Because the prophets had said that if God's chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, refuse to listen to him and to obey him, that God would discipline them severely. There were many times of discipline. We read about them in the Old Testament. And there are generic prophecies that we find in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, 29, all the way through 32. And it's repeated in the prophets that if God's people will not listen to him, he will send them out of the land. This is what happened when the northern ten tribes were taken captive by the Assyrians in 722. This is what happened in 586 and 605 BC when the Babylonians came in and stole things, first of all, from the temple and took them back to Babylon, and then destroyed the first temple of Solomon and took many people captive and took them into Babylon for 70 years of captivity. It's going to be repeated, Jesus says, just as in the past, for your refusal to believe me, God brings judgment upon his people whom he has chosen. So again, there will be a day of vengeance because Jerusalem had, had not recognized the day of her visitation. We already read that passage earlier in Luke. A terrible experience. This is not anti-Semitic language because the Jewish prophets themselves lay the foundation for this pattern. Moses predicted this. The Jewish prophets predicted this. Jesus repeated it. And yet we find that God did this for the Jewish people, not because he hated them and wanted to cancel his covenant with them, but because he loved them and wanted to shake them uh, awake from their idolatrous stupor. Today, we are still in this period that Jesus talks about when he refers to the times of the Gentiles in verse 24. Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, will be smashed, the temple will be taken down, and Jerusalem will be trodden upon. It is a, a metaphoric expression that deals with total disdain. When you walk on something, you even see this today in the Middle East, when you take off your shoe and you bang it against the statue of Saddam Hussein. Remember that some years ago? Or you walk on somebody's flag. It's a demonstration when you try, you tread on something, you, you hate it, you have absolutely no respect for it, you loathe it. And Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles began when the Gentile power of Babylon took control over the city of Jerusalem in 605. And since then, almost six centuries before Christ, all the way up till today, 2,000 years after, so 2,600 years roughly, the Jewish people have not been in total control of the location of their temple and of their city. There has not been a Davidic king seated on the throne of David ever since that time. Even when the Hasmoneans came uh, after the Maccabean revolt, some centuries before Christ, and uh, they managed to push the Syrians out. Remember we talked about this on Saturday morning when we were talking about the intertestamental period. Even during that time, no Davidic king was seated on the throne of David. These were 
priests who tried to liberate the Jews from the Syrian powers. And so we're still in the time of the Gentiles, and Jerusalem is still trodden down today. If you were a Jew and you want to go up to the Temple Mount, you can't really openly pray there because if you've gone up there, you've seen how this goes. There are uh, many people representing various strands and strains of uh, the Islamic religion who watch what everybody does. And if you're a Jew and you go around the Al-Aqsa Mosque and then go around to the eastern side and pull along the northern side and then come back to the west, you better be talking to each other. But if you're caught praying with your little prayer cords, uh, or if you begin to bob like this, uh, there'll be war. They are not in charge. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan runs that uh, Al-Aqsa compound, the Jews don't. And that's the way it's been since 18, so, sorry, since 1187 AD. The Waqf arrangement has been uh, running since then, and since 1948, the Hashemite kingdom has been in charge of that uh, stewardship of that location. In verses 25 to 27, we see some things that are going to occur before the end of the times of the Gentiles and the coming of the Son of Man. Now, hang on to your hat. Uh, by now you're beginning to get a little tired because there's a lot of information that I'm dumping on you, but I'm committed to get through the chapter and we will make it. Look at verse 25. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. <coughs> There's a shift again in verse 25 toward the long term, because he has just talked about the time when the times of the Gentiles will be concluded. Jerusalem is trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then he begins to talk about these signs in the sun and moon and stars. And so now we're going again long term in Jesus' predictions about what is going to happen. Now there are Bible students, they call themselves preterists who would say that everything in um, Luke 21 and the parallel passages have already all been fulfilled. And the reason that I'm not convinced by their arguments is really quite simple. And that is this. That in the section that we just looked at, which, talk, which talks about the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman armies, they would take that prediction in a straightforward, plain meaning that it was literally fulfilled. But the things preceding that prediction and the things after that prediction, they would interpret symbolically. And they would say that all of this has already happened and that Jesus has already come to Israel in judgment. The coming of the Son of Man is a past event when Jerusalem was judged by its destruction. I don't find that convincing at all. Because it doesn't match with so many other things that we find in the Gospels. And Lord willing, in the coming days, and we want to look at some of these other passages that talk about these events and, and see what Jesus said about his return. <laughs> it is going to be a bodily return, and it is going to be preceded by certain signs which have not yet occurred. But it's not hard to imagine how they could. As we mentioned a moment ago, verse 27, the whole world is going to see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The Shekinah, the Shekinah glory, we often call it. The appearance of the glory of Jehovah God 
that appeared also among the people of Israel as they moved around in the desert. Remember uh, the cloud of glory that would appear during the daytime, and when the cloud when the cloud picked up and moved, then the Jewish people had to take down their tents and move behind it. And at night there was the um, the, the cloud. I guess it was the other way around: the cloud in the daytime and the cloud of fire at night. But this was the presence of God, and the, the glory of God also demonstrated itself at the dedication of the first temple. When Solomon dedicated the temple, the Shekinah came down upon the, the, the temple in such a visible and powerful way that the text says that the, the, the priests could not stand to minister. They were all flat on their faces. There will be no questions about what this is all about when Jesus returns. Verse 28. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. You say, well, but Jesus is speaking to a specific generation of people here, right? I mean, the disciples who are asking him the question are getting an answer to their question. And so isn't all of this going to be fulfilled in the generation of the people who hear his answer? Well, keep in mind that when you read Old Testament prophetic material, a spokesman for God can speak to you and address his audience visibly present in front of him. And yet the descendants of those people may also be in the prophet's mind. And so that the you is a kind of a collective you. <clears throat> the redemption that he's speaking about here in verse 28, it's not speaking about personal salvation. It's speaking about the redemption of the people of Israel and their reconciliation with God after all these centuries. Here's an illustration, verse 29. He spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. Now this is a very simple uh, analogy. And you understand, you live in Spain, and you know how the seasons go. And I'm looking at my Bumandilia, which we have in front of our house in our front terrace. And it's, a, frankly, a pretty sad state right now. Uh, you know, Bumandilia is at least mine. Maybe I'm not a very good gardener. But uh, when we had all that wind some months ago, the, the wind just about knocked the thing over. All of the uh, leaves got pricked up against the thorns in my Bumandilia, and they're almost ripped to shreds now. And I'm just kind of waiting for the evenings to get a little warmer, and then whoosh, I know that the shoots are going to come out. And when the shoots come out, then I know that we're going to have more flowers, because that's the way it goes. And that's all that Jesus is trying to say here. When you see a, a fig tree or any kind of tree, there are certain times of the year when the leaves begin to come out, and when they come out, you know summer's close. So likewise ye, verse 31, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Now that's an interesting statement. That certainly must indicate that the kingdom will not yet have been inaugurated. Because it means that it's coming very close. That when the king comes and is visibly present, reigning on the face of the earth, the kingdom of God will be here. And when you see these things happen, know that it's right at the doorpost. Verily I say unto you, verse 32, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And I believe that in verse 32, the reference to the generation here is the generation that sees the signs. And I believe that he's speaking about the Jewish people. There's sometimes when the word generation in the New Testament can refer to a people group. But in the context of Luke 21 and the parallel passages in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, the generation that sees the signs will not pass away until it all happens. And that means that once the signs kick in, things are going to move very rapidly. We're not going to be waiting thousands of years for Jesus to return in power and glory to set up his kingdom. When the signs are initiated, the generation that sees the beginning of the signs will also see the coming of the Son of Man to reign. The kingdom will come.
Now, what does this have to do with all of us? Some practical conclusions. Jesus is a great teacher because he never, never talks about future things just to tickle the curiosity of his interlocutors. Look at verse 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. <laughs> In other words, uh, don't let your heart be burdened down with excess worry. And don't get involved either in drunkenness and the cares of this life, that is, escapism, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Notice that verse 35 is talking about things in universal proportions, all around the globe, just as it says in verse 24 that um, the Jews will be send, sent into dispersion among all the nations. There is a worldwide dimension to all of this, which leads me to believe that the end of this chapter is speaking about the time right before Jesus returns uh, bodily to rule and reign. Verse 36, this is the capstone where he brings in the punch. This is application. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Vigilance and confidence. Now, there are a lot of people who were to might read a chapter like this who say, well, that's really spooky. That's alarming. That kind of makes you afraid. And isn't it ironic that Jesus says, don't let your faith be shaken. This is going to happen. Um, recognize that it is uh, on the program of God in his dealings with the Jewish people and with the nations as well. Watch and be a person of prayer so that you will be able to escape these kinds of judgments and be able to enter into the kingdom when it comes. And the scriptures say that there will be Jews in that seven-year period who will be converted and will be divinely protected from being killed. And so that when Jesus comes, they will be able to enter into that kingdom. And we see that uh, in Matthew 25. There is a fearlessness and a freedom from worry that should mark us. And I wonder if that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, when you listen to the news these days, we're not even thinking about the time of great testing uh, when the contractions of the birth of Israel actually kick in. Uh, we're, we're not yet there. But the news these days is, uh, is not all that happy. And it is possible for Christian people to become burdened down. I think we need to know what happens. Uh, we need to understand what is happening around us. But we are not to be panicking. Because we have a mission, and that is in chapter 24. And I end with this. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 49. Jesus said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, that opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And that's the answer to the question we started with. What is the mission of the church? Are things going to get better and better due to the impact of believers in various countries? Well, maybe there might be some times in specific locations in history where there will be some improvement and greater revival of Christian faith <coughs> Uh, when you look at the scope of history, they are exceptional. And when you look at the 
the sweep of Luke 21, you get the idea that the church is not going to approve the world. <coughs> the church is going to be opposed by the world. The church will be <coughs> persecuted in some cases by the world. And if you wonder about that, go to some of the places in, in the world today where Christians are being tortured and killed, where the churches are being burned to the ground, and where there is active legal attack against Christians who wish nobody any ill. No, the church is not going to improve the world. The church's mission is to do verses 47 and 48. The disciples were witnesses of the resurrection of Christ, and if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be a, a person who gives testimony to what he has done in your life. And it is your mission to proclaim repentance and remission of sins among the nations. And that's challenge enough <laughs> to do that faithfully. And so let's be very realistic <clears throat> about what our little church here <clears throat> is called to do in the plan of God. Remember the days of Noah? Was his mission to make the world a better place? You read Genesis chapter 6, and you see this, you know, Moses uses this incredible language, you know, the, the whole world was filled with violence, and all the thoughts of men's hearts completely everywhere, uh, he, he tumbles over himself to get across the idea that the place was a mess, a disaster. But there was one man who was righteous before God's eyes, and God said, Noah, I want you to build a barge. And these are the dimensions. I want you to cover it with pitch and in the inside, and uh, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. It, it, Moses probably had 120 years to build a barge and to be, be a preacher. And we see in 2 Peter 2, 5, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And he must have given lots of invitations to people to come into the ark with him. Nobody listened. except his wife and his sons and their wives. Eight people. The animals God brought to the ark and they didn't have to make any decisions about salvation. Moses' mission was clear. Build the ark, save yourself and your family, and preach my righteousness. And whether people are going to come or not, well, we're still talking about Noah, aren't we? Did he change the world? God changed the world. And Noah was faithful in the middle of that mission of calling people to repentance and forgiveness of sin. And that's, that's our mission. Amen. This needs to be absolutely crystal clear in your mind if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Don't think that God expects you to do the impossible. Do what is possible. Be a godly man or woman. Live consistently with Scripture by the power of the Spirit of God. Let your witness be known, and we'll see what God does. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God can use us in a wonderful way, even though we're just a small group, to impact many people in these very troubled times. Let's have a clear-eyed view of what we are about recognizing that things are not going to get better overall. They're going to get far grimmer with time. But in the middle of that darkness, you can be a faithful light. And your light, if you let it shine, will be visible. That's great news. Amen. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. It's not real easy for us to digest all the details. And I, I trust that uh, our little study here tonight will encourage us to go back through Luke 21 and the parallel passages to read them again and to try to figure out how these things uh, will take place. Give us understanding as time goes by and we search the scriptures to see if these things be true. And may we be marked by this vigilance and fearlessness in troubled times. Help us to be faithful to the calling that you have given to us.